Some of the earliest sources of natural pigments in art history came from rocks and minerals. Today we're going to take a look at some of the gems and minerals that rocked the art world. All right, I'll stop with the puns. First, let's shed some light on the subject with white, specifically lead white. Lead white was the only white used in European easel paintings up until the 19th century. And it's this white pigment that gives those classical paintings like Vermeer's Milkmaid and Girl with the Pearl Earring their luminous quality. The primary ingredient in making lead white, a hydrated lead carbonate, is very similar to the mineral sericite, which gets its name from the Latin word cerusa or white lead. Wow, it's all starting to click now. Roman authors Pliny and Vitruvius both wrote accounts of the process for making this pigment. An early recipe for lead white details how strips of metallic lead would be placed in porous earthenware pots over a bath of weak acidic acid, or vinegar, and left in a shed with, wait for it, wait for it, fermenting manure producing heat and CO2. After a few months, the acidic and carbonic acids would react with the surface lead, creating a white crust, which was then scraped off, dried out, and ground up, creating a pure white powder to be mixed with a paint medium. This brilliant white was a mainstay in artwork from the Greeks all the way up until the 1970s when it was banned. But why? Well, lead is super toxic and was the hidden cause behind painter's colic, or what we would call lead poisoning. Yeah, it turns out breathing clouds of powdered lead is pretty bad for you. Next, let's look at one of the more rare colors in the natural world. Unlike green, brown, or even red and yellow, it can be hard to find blue coloring agents in nature. So it makes sense that many people believe blue was the first synthetic pigment ever created, specifically Egyptian blue. This soft azure hue was created around 3000 BC and was used until the fall of the Roman Empire. The recipe for its creation is detailed in the book De Architectura by Roman author and architect Vitruvius. The ingredients used were sand, copper, embalming salt, and chalk. This mix was rolled into little balls and then baked in a furnace for anywhere from 10 to 100 hours. This blue can be seen in Egyptian burial tombs and, amazingly enough, has aged a lot better than some of the other colors used. This remarkable longevity piqued the interest of scientists. A 2009 study found that the ancient pigment could be useful in lasers, telecommunications, and biomedical analysis, given how bright it is under infrared light even thousands of years later. The Egyptians may not have discovered the secret to eternal life, but their iconic blue color is just getting its second wind. In the Middle Ages after Egyptian blue had run its course, another blue needed to step up. That blue was azurite, made from, you guessed it, azurite. Mineral azurite was ground up, washed, and sieved to get this color. It was so prevalent that it can be seen in Chinese wall paintings from the Ming and Sung dynasties, and even in Japan and Egypt. It was the most important blue during the Middle Ages and all the way up to the Renaissance until it was finally synthesized in the 17th century. It was eventually replaced in the 18th century by Prussian blue, a synthetic pigment. While we're talking about azurite, we should mention a mineral that's often found growing with it, and that's malachite. Malachite is the source of what is perhaps the oldest known green pigment. It can be found in artwork from as far back as Egyptian tomb paintings and all over 15th and 16th century European paintings. But let's go back to blue for a second. During the Renaissance, patrons of the arts who wanted to flaunt their wealth would contract the top artists of the time and spared no expense to make sure they had the best materials at their disposal. But there was one color that was so rare and coveted that became more expensive than gold. The deepest blue, the bluest blue, the most expensive blue, the under the sea blue, the blue that nearly bankrupted Vermeer and supposedly left Michelangelo's entombment unfinished. Can you tell I'm passionate? I'm talking about the mother of all blues, ultramarine. Made from lapis lazuli, this is one of the most expensive pigments of all time. The origins of this color go way back to 6th century Afghanistan, and for hundreds of years, this was the only known source of lapis lazuli. When it was introduced to Europe, this brilliant blue was almost always reserved for the clothing of Christ or the Virgin Mary. This makes sense given that the wealthiest patrons were often churches commissioning the best artists of the day to paint the most important figures in Christianity. It wasn't until the 1830s when the Société d'Encouragement offered 7,000 francs to the first person to successfully synthesize ultramarine that the art world was able to wean itself off of the good stuff. Still, the natural thing was preferred by many artists and you can still get it today. But guess what? It still isn't cheap. 
Now that we've covered one of the most decadent pigments in history, let's give a shout out to art's more humble origins. Many of the earliest cave paintings were made using red and yellow ochre. Ochre comes from the Greek word okros, meaning yellow, and can be found pretty much everywhere. It gets its color from iron oxides in the ground, like hematite or gertite. Early humans would seek out this colored earth, dig it up, grind it up, and wash it, leaving a rust-colored substance that they would then paint onto walls using plant brushes or just their fingers. It could even be roasted for a deeper brown color. Though its origins are prehistoric, it was used for centuries. In the Middle Ages and Renaissance, Michelangelo and Rembrandt were known for using natural red hematite chalks and these colors wouldn't be synthesized for several hundred years after that. Ever since Colored Earth first got those creative wheels turning, we humans have been using the gems and minerals of the natural world to fuel our desire for creative expression. And I don't see that stopping anytime soon. What gemstone do you wish you could turn into a paint color? Let us know down below and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss out on future content. Thanks for watching.